Before viewing this training program, take particular note that, since the behaviour of a vehicle that is undergoing running tests can be unpredictable, all running tests must be conducted where there are no confinements or obstructions close to the vehicle. By obeying this important safety rule, you can prevent possible damage and personal injury. Here in diagrammatic form is the control idea used with Leyland pneumocyclic gearboxes. This is the latest six-way control system, of which there are minor variations as a result of design updating. However, the basic control idea is the same. The system that controls the transmission side of the vehicle, that is, the gearbox, the flywheel, and the rear axle, comprises four basic components. There's the auxiliary air tank of the vehicle, which, when charged, has an air pressure of between 105 and 120 pounds per square inch. From the auxiliary air tank, air passes to a limiting valve here. This limiting valve reduces the air pressure down to the working pressure of the control system, which is usually between 80 and 85 pounds per square inch. But there are exceptions to this pressure. Therefore, always consult the vehicle or the program data sheet for the correct air pressure. When the air has passed through the limiting valve, it then flows to the entry point of the electro-pneumatic unit, where it passes through an air filter here, before passing into the electro-pneumatic unit. An electrical supply is passed to this, the change speed unit. It's the change speed unit which, on manual selection of the appropriate gear, will send an electrical impulse to the electro-pneumatic unit where a solenoid will come into operation to release air from the EP unit to the selected gear within the gearbox. For maintenance and fault diagnosis purposes, take particular note that a neutral wire runs from the change speed unit to the plug that takes the electrical impulse into the EP unit. In addition, on some models, there is an intermediate connection between the change speed unit and the EP unit. There are two main types of pneumocyclic gearbox, but the main gearbox casing is the same on each type. This gearbox, for example, is a remote mounted type and, having a separate flywheel, both the gearbox and the flywheel have independent oil supplies. A Leyland National, for example, has a close coupled gearbox with a charged flywheel. That means that oil is pumped through this pipe system from the gearbox to charge the flywheel with oil. The Leyland Atlantean also has a close coupled gearbox with a charged flywheel. However, since the engine of the Atlantean is mounted transversely at the rear of the vehicle and this has an angled drive, the oil to charge the flywheel is drawn from and returned to the angle drive after lubricating the gearbox. When a vehicle is fitted with a gearbox having only four forward gears and a reverse gear, the control system will incorporate a five-way EP unit. When a vehicle with five forward gears and reverse was introduced prior to the design of the six-way EP unit, a single EP unit was added to the control system to accommodate the additional gear. You'll find that on systems of this configuration, the single EP unit may serve either fifth gear or reverse. A direct air control is an alternative to the electro-pneumatic change speed unit, but for the purpose of this training program, and since all of the maintenance and major gearbox fault diagnosis points to be made apply in general to all of the system types that have now been shown, the work will be demonstrated on a vehicle that has a six-way EP unit in its gearbox control system. As an example, assume that a vehicle on its return to the depot is reported to have a condition of no drive in second gear. The first check should be made here. Toggle the gearbox brake band by engaging the gear approximately 12 times. 
pause briefly between these applications or the correct adjustment will not take place. If the problem is simply one of adjustment, this toggling exercise may correct the no drive or slip condition. If the fault is not cured by toggling, proceed in the following manner. This is the point where the air pipes from the EP unit enter the gearbox. It's here that you can establish whether a fault condition lies within the gearbox or whether it's in the change speed system. With the air tanks of the vehicle in a charge condition and the change speed lever in neutral, release the air inlet line here that feeds to second gear. Now select second gear. If air escapes from the end of this pipe when it's released, and you'll hear if air is present, then the control system is functioning correctly, and it's therefore a clear sign that it's the gearbox that is at fault. However, if there is no air escaping from the pipe outlet, it means that there's a fault in the control system. Therefore, first replace the air inlet pipe and proceed to examine the control system in the following manner. First, disconnect the plug that takes the electrical supply from the change speed unit to the entry point of the EP unit and examine this socket for any sign of dirt or corrosion that would prevent a current flow and cause a malfunction. Examine also the plug for the same reason. The plug has a location channel and each socket hole has an identification letter. Here is the location channel of the plug. The central hole is the neutral. This is the first gear socket. And this is the second gear supply socket. To determine whether there is an electrical supply from the change speed unit to this plug, use a test lamp fitted with a bulb that will consume no more than 0.7 of an amp. Place one lead of the test lamp in the second gear socket and the other in the neutral socket. Now apply second gear intermittently. If there's power from the change speed unit to the EP plug and to the second gear socket, the bulb will light. In some change speed selectors, only momentarily, because the circuitry of some change speed units is set to cut out on either underload or overload. On the underside of this change speed unit, the two-speed protection device is situated here, and beneath this cover are the electrical connections of the unit. If on any occasion a flow of current isn't available to the EP unit plug, check that all of the wires and the connections here are secure and that there are no signs of corrosion. Also, operate the change speed unit and ensure that the contacts are, indeed, making contact. Then, on the occasions when the vehicle you're servicing is fitted with an intermediate connection like this between the change speed unit and the EP unit, ensure that there's electrical continuity through the connection. You'll also come across this type of change speed unit. Again, always check the connections, both to and from the unit, are secure and clean. This is the location of the two-gear trip-out assembly. Here is the range of EP units in service. The six-way EP is at the bottom. Above it, the five-way EP unit is used both as a four-speed control or with the single EP unit on the left to control a five-speed gearbox. On the earlier five-way EP unit, the valves can be operated manually by depressing the top of the units, like this, to operate the air valves. If air passes to the second gear from the EP during the manual operation, then the valve mechanism is in order, and the fault will be found to be in the solenoid or in the wiring between the plug socket and the solenoid. Each gear has a separate solenoid, and each solenoid has a spindle, like this one, which is, in fact, the exhaust valve. The EP unit, being a modular construction, allows for the exchange of faulty portions of the individual solenoid assemblies, or, depending on your local service facility, 
you may exchange the complete EP unit. The air inlet valve is to be found here, at the base of the EP unit. Within the valve, there's this thin spindle and spring arrangement. A mechanical malfunction of either of these delicate mechanisms will make the valve inoperative or a leakage occur through the vent hole on the side of the cover of the EP unit. Always check this vent hole, first with the gear control lever in neutral to see if there's a leakage and then engage each gear in turn. If the air leak on the vent stops when a particular gear is applied, then it's the inlet valve for that gear that's at fault within the EP unit. Take note that updated designs of the six-way EP unit have a combined inlet and exhaust valve mechanism that's contained within the solenoid and can't be operated manually. However, the valve requires little in the way of inspection and if it does malfunction, it's very easy to replace. Again, it's important that a check is made on all electrical connections. Are they secure? Are they clean and free of corrosion? Particularly on early EP units ensure that if any connections are loose, any two are not in contact. For well, this would in fact cause the two gear trip out in the change speed unit to isolate with the result that there would be a two gear loss on the vehicle. Here on the six way EP unit, each of the wires from the electrical inlet plug has an identification mark. These identification marks correspond to those on this terminal board. Therefore to ensure that there is continuity from the inlet plug to the terminals, Select second gear and place one lead of the test lamp on the neutral terminal and the other on the terminal for second gear. If the bulb lights, you have an electrical supply from the chain speed lever to the solenoids within the EP unit. If we now assume that air is present at the inlet to the gearbox when you make the first check on a fault condition, proceed in the following manner. First, apply second gear and return to the gearbox area and check the breather like this. If air is present here, then it's a clear indication that the second gear piston seal isn't functioning correctly, and thus providing either a no drive or a partial slip condition in second gear. If air is present at the breather of the gearbox, remove the piston from the cylinder by removing the four screws from the base plate here. The piston assembly can then be lowered and removed for inspection. Of the two seals on the piston, this lower one is the air seal. Both seals should be replaced. While the cylinder is exposed during this exercise, always inspect it for scoring or cracks on its surface. It's vital that, prior to any adjustment being carried out on the brake bands, the following check is made to ensure that the air pressure from the limiting valve of the auxiliary tank is set to the correct pressure. Therefore, fit a pressure gauge at the gearbox supply inlet and apply the gear to check the air pressure at this point. Here, the air pressure is low and the fault can easily be rectified as follows. Return to the limiting valve and slacken off the lock nut of the valve. To increase the air pressure from the tank to the gearbox, wind the adjustment screw in like this. And after tightening the lock nut, apply the gear once more and check the reading on the gauge. The reading is now correct, therefore adjustment of the brake band can commence. Remove the cover from the band adjustment section of the gearbox and examine the thread depth on the adjuster nuts. If the pull rod is within one eighth of an inch of the top of the adjuster nut, this indicates that the brake band lining is approaching the end of its effective life. On this, the older type of gearbox, the thread depth that we see on these adjuster nuts shows that there's working life left in each brake band. However, here's an example 
where the thread depth of the adjuster nut tells us that the brake band for this gear is worn out. But later types of this gearbox have a different length of pull rod. These adjuster nuts, therefore, show the thread depth to the pull rod top when the brake bands are new. If the brake bands were excessively worn, the pull rod end would protrude through the adjuster nut some three-eighths of an inch. Measurement for correct brake band adjustment is carried out by placing this special gauge between the adjuster table and the brake band. This measurement is correct. Here's an example of over adjustment of the brake band. And the cause of this? The striker screw has been set too far out. This is another extreme example. Here the problem is under adjustment. Uh, there would be a number of causes for this condition. It can be that the striker screw has been incorrectly set. The striker plate may be binding on the adjuster nut. The adjuster nut may be tight on the pull rod thread. Or the adjusting spring may have been incorrectly fitted. It can be rather confusing when replacing these adjuster springs and it's very easy to fit them incorrectly. Here are three adjuster springs in position. But let's ask you, the viewer, which one has been positioned correctly? It's the centre spring that has been fitted correctly. But since there are many ways in which this spring can be fitted incorrectly, watch this demonstration of adjustment spring fitting. First, position the central single arm of the spring on the pillar of the striker plate and push the centre of the coil down to the collar of the nut positively. Then position the arm of the spring with the double eye securely at the top of the same pillar. And finally, place the remaining arm here on the pillar of the adjuster table. Before replacing the adjuster nut and its assembly, check that the striker plate doesn't bind when the assembly is complete. Clamp it to the striker plate between your fingers like this. Any restriction here would cause a malfunction on the automatic adjustment. Positioning of these components can then be carried out as the commencing exercise in the manual setting of the automatic brake band adjustment mechanism. Always ensure that the adjuster nut runs down the pull rod thread with ease. Now, with the mechanism in position and using this special tool, tighten the brake band in order that it may become centralised on the brake drum. When the band is fully down, take the adjuster nut back six half turns. This will provide you with an approximate setting position for the start of the brake band setting sequence. But before proceeding, release the lock on the striker screw and screw it in. Using either, as here, an independent air supply or the air system of the vehicle, apply the specified pressure to the brake band and check the distance between the brake band and the adjuster table. In this instance, the gap is too wide. Therefore, release the air pressure and turn the adjuster nut only slightly in an anti-clockwise direction. This will allow the table to become closer to the brake band on the next application. Now, check the gap once more. When the gauge will just support itself between the adjuster table and the brake band, the setting is correct. It's now time to bring the striker screw back until it just slightly deflects the striker plate, like this, and tighten down the lock nut of the striker screw. It's the striker screw that sets the degree of automatic adjustment that will take place. At this stage, place a reference mark on the striker plate in line with the slots of the adjuster nut. Then release the gear and take it one quarter of a turn out of adjustment in order that, with the spring refitted, we can check whether our automatic adjustment is functioning correctly as the adjuster nut is moved into adjustment in a clockwise direction towards the datum mark on the striker plate. When the spring has been fitted, 
release the gear and then begin a gear cycling sequence. As the gear is cycled, automatic adjustment will begin. It can be seen here that the slight adjustment takes place only when the gear is released. Therefore, always have a pause between gear release and gear reapplication in this automatic adjusting sequence. When the gear has been cycled to a point where the adjuster nut has stopped turning and the slots of the adjuster nut have stopped short of the reference mark, then the striker screw isn't far enough out. If the slots of the adjuster nut go beyond the reference mark, then the reverse is the case. The striker screw is too far out. In either case, the condition should be corrected satisfactorily before once more replacing the gearbox cover. If the one gear slip condition hadn't been on any of the indirect gears but on top gear, a different adjusting procedure would have to be applied. First, remove the drain plug and substitute this depth gauge adapter. With top gear disengaged, screw down the threaded portion of the centre of the adapter until it just touches the base of the piston. And take note of the measurement like this. Now place the gear control lever in the top gear position. Return to the gearbox area and screw the centre of the adapter down once more until it comes to rest on top of the piston and take a second reading. The difference between the two readings that you've now taken indicates the true piston travel and this must always be maintained or adjusted by the use of shims on the piston push rod or a slip condition on top gear will result. If you start the engine of the vehicle, place the gear control lever in second gear release the handbrake and on depressing the throttle there's no forward movement of the vehicle this may be due to a stall no drive condition or a neutral no drive condition therefore with the throttle fully depressed listen to the engine revs maximum revs running light will indicate a neutral no drive condition if the engine labors and only achieves half revs you have a stall no drive condition on the vehicle When a stall no drive condition occurs, always make a check that the parking brakes have been released. There may be a two gear application within the gearbox or top gear clutch plates may have seized to provide the same fault condition, a lock up in the transmission. Although it's unlikely, a stall no drive condition could be caused by a mechanical fault in the valve mechanism of the EP unit. It's also unlikely to be an electrical fault because there is a two gear protection device in the gear control lever. With a remote mounted gearbox, you can confirm a stall no drive condition if you check the small prop shaft between the flywheel and the gearbox. This will be stationary when the change speed lever is in neutral. Here's an example of a stall condition in the transmission. If the vehicle drives in neutral, it's an indication of a potential two-gear situation. Therefore, to discover which gear is causing the condition, operate the change speed control through each gear in turn. Only when the change speed lever is in neutral and in the gear that is at fault will the vehicle move forward. Once the problem gear has been identified, the air pipe to that gear at the entrance of the gearbox should be released to determine whether the fault lies in either the control mechanism or within the gearbox. If there's air present at this point when the gear control lever is in neutral, it's the control mechanism that is at fault. If there's no air present, then the fault lies in the gearbox. When it's found that the vehicle won't move in any of the gears selected, a condition of neutral no drive exists. To identify the problem area, carry out the following checks. Is the rear axle in order? Is there sufficient oil in the flywheel? Is there an air supply to and from the auxiliary air tank? If there isn't, check the system protection valve on the inlet to the tank. Is the air filter to the EP unit clean? 
Is there a power supply to the gear control lever? Now, with the engine running and second gear selected, examine the flywheel area beneath the vehicle. If the small prop shaft between the flywheel and the gearbox is rotating, then the flywheel is in order. However, again, on a close coupled gearbox, this check wouldn't be possible. Inspect the main prop shaft that runs from the gearbox to the rear axle. If it's stationary in this test condition, it's in order. But if the prop shaft is revolving like this, it's a clear indication that there's a failure in the axle shaft or driving head in the rear axle. If the drive to the rear axle is in order, then the fault may be found to be in the area of the air supply to the gearbox, and the problem should be approached in the following manner. Check that the auxiliary air tank is fully charged, and that it's providing the correct pressure to the EP unit through the limiting valve. When you slacken off nuts in any air circuit, the presence of an air supply will be audible, but when you're completely releasing nuts in the air circuit, always empty the air tank first. Having established that there is an air supply to this point, the air filter should now be removed and examined to ensure that it isn't blocked in any way. If there is a correct supply of air to the EP unit, then it may be that there's a fault in the power supply which prevents the operation of the solenoid within the EP. On some vehicles, the gear control is linked electrically to the starter system, and therefore the engine won't start if there's a power failure. On vehicles with this type of change speed control, the warning light won't illuminate if there is a power failure. Here, the engine is running and a gear has been selected. The handbrake has been released. Therefore, the small prop shaft from the flywheel should be turning to provide vehicle movement. If it isn't, then there's insufficient oil in the flywheel to drive the gearbox. Therefore, stop the engine and examine the area around the flywheel because an oil leak, usually from the seal of the flywheel, would be very much in evidence. On vehicles that have a charged flywheel, a major oil leak would again be obvious on exterior inspection. But the other fault condition that would cause a no-drive situation on a vehicle that has a charged flywheel is where correct maintenance hasn't been carried out and the internal oil filter has become blocked to cause a starvation of oil to the flywheel. On the Atlantean, oil is taken from the angle drive through an internal filter and pumped to the flywheel. A Leyland National has a charged flywheel, and the oil for the flywheel is drawn from the base of the gearbox, again through a fixed internal filter. Here is the filter, and since it's at the base of the gearbox, you can establish whether it's clear and passing oil to the flywheel by releasing the lock on the pipework that goes from the gearbox to the flywheel to check for a free flow of oil with the engine off. Always carry out an inspection of each restrictor by first releasing the air supply pipe to the gear when the chain speed lever is in a neutral position. The complete restrictor adapter can now be unscrewed from the piston base plate. Each restrictor has an identification groove. In this view, the groove is on the narrow part of the restrictor on the left. This is the air supply hole that faces the gearbox. And this is the air release hole. The larger hole on the other end is the hole that accepts air from the supply. The restrictor is the vital component that times the application and the release of all the indirect gears. Each restrictor within any gearbox is different, and they're different again in different vehicle types. It's important, therefore, that a full check is made on the program data sheet in order that the correct restrictor is fitted to each gear. Every restrictor should be fitted this way round, with the reduced end nearest to the operating cylinder. 
When fitted correctly, this is the airflow pattern through the restrictor on gear application. And this is the airflow pattern when the gear is released. Here's an example where the restrictor has been fitted the wrong way round. When the gear is applied, it will receive an air supply through two of the holes in the restrictor and therefore it will apply the band too rapidly. When the gear is released, there's only one escape route for the air and therefore the band will release too slowly. Therefore, in a three gear change situation, what will be the result of a restrictor being fitted the wrong way round in an up gear change sequence? When second gear is released and third gear is applied, second gear comes off at the correct speed, but third gear, because of the wrong airflow through the restrictor, goes on too quickly. And the result? Band overlap or a momentary two gear situation. On the gear change from third to fourth, a similar situation, but in reverse, will occur. When third gear is released, because it has only one air escape path instead of two, the band will come off too slowly, while fourth gear will apply at the correct speed, causing a band overlap situation. So remember, always ensure that restrictors are fitted correctly and that it's the correct restrictor that you fit. Remove the drain plug from the pistons regularly to ensure that oil isn't gathering at the bottom of the piston base plate, since this can seriously affect the smoothness of a gear change sequence. If oil is gathering in the base plate, then remove the piston and renew the oil seal and also the air seal since whenever the piston is removed, both seals should always be renewed. Here, there's a small quantity of oil in the base plate. At the moment, it's relatively harmless. However, if correct maintenance isn't carried out in this area, the oil level will rise until the oil starts to pass down this central hole, not only into the restrictor housing, but also flowing right through to the EP unit, thus seriously affecting a gear change sequence. Here, in diagrammatic form, is an example of the fault which will occur if oil is allowed in the restrictor area of third gear. When a gear change takes place from second to third, the effect will be this. Second gear will come off at the correct speed, but third gear will go on too slowly because the oil is restricting the airflow. During this band underlap situation, there's a temporary neutral situation in which the engine revolutions will increase to provide a false indication that the band is slipping. When third gear is released, the band will come off too slowly, while fourth gear will engage at the correct speed. The result will be that for a very short period, there'll be a two gear application on the vehicle or a band overlap situation. With this condition, a severe jolt will occur through both the gearbox and the transmission to the ultimate detriment of both of these units. To achieve optimum performance and the maximum life to the running components of the vehicle in your charge, always change or clean oil filters and suction filters where applicable at the correct intervals and use the specified grades of oil. A vehicle with a charge flywheel should have your special attention since there are particular filling procedures for lubricant. For guidance, examine your program notes. The air tanks of a vehicle should be drained periodically and air supply operating pressures should always be checked and adjusted as necessary to prevent premature failure of brake bands. The vent on both the gearbox and the EP unit should be checked as recommended in your program notes. And the air filter to the EP unit must always be clean. Always disconnect the prop shaft or withdraw the axle shafts when towing the vehicle. If you don't, the gearbox will be starved of oil, with the result that first, top gear clutch plates will seize 
followed by the components of all other gears. Always conduct running tests on the vehicle where there are no confinements or obstructions close to the vehicle and you can help to prevent possible damage and personal injury. If all of the points outlined in this training program are followed carefully, you'll be able to identify a fault condition quickly and accurately. And if you carry out the maintenance and preventative maintenance checks as recommended, you'll make a valuable contribution to the extension of the working life of the semi-automatic gearbox.